This is where my cartoon avatar says an introductory line. Down under the big top is a 1996 film starring the Newsboys, a prominent Christian music act from Australia. Get it? Down under the big top? The film was distributed as a direct-to-video VHS release and directed by Steve Taylor, the highly noted Christian singer, songwriter, producer, actor, record executive, you know, media person. I'll be the first to admit, this wasn't what I had originally planned on talking about. One of my early goals for the video essays was to establish the scope, which is to say, cover something different with each episode, and yet, here I am with my second piece of Christian media, my third comedy movie, and my third of a planned four relived selections from my own childhood. In fact, before I filmed my piece on Down With Love, I thought it'd be fun to expand the scope with a stage musical like Love Never Dies, because the titles of the two are almost opposite of one another. But I figured I'd leave that to somebody more invested in the Phantom of the Opera fandom. I'd call it the fandom, but that's already a thing. I don't really have anything to add, I just kinda liked Love Never Dies in less of an ironic, wow, this is such beautiful trash kind of way than most. Lindsay Ellis can have this one. Though, hey, did you know that Lindsay included a clip from my Les Mis video in her essay about cats? Without crediting or acknowledging me? And now the cats video has more views than that video? Maybe one day I'll make my Love Never Dies episode out of pure playful spite. You're off track already. Get back to the Aussie Bible song movie. Yes, ma'am. As the film was designed for a VHS-only release, the versions you can find online are exactly the visual quality you'd expect. The version I'm showcasing here includes visuals uploaded to YouTube by Buttercreamer2010 in seven parts, and the audio from another YouTube upload by Brian Bratcher. I've made a couple of visual alterations to avoid being automatically copyright-stricken. Still, I was really pleased to find it so easily, seeing as how our family copy of the movie is probably lost in storage somewhere, and I'm not sure anyone in my family still owns a VCR. The plot of the movie is based on the Newsboys song, Reality, which itself is a take on the story of the prodigal son. That story goes that a young boy demanded his share of his father's estate and left home to live in excess, only to wind up impoverished and eventually return home to a happily awaiting family. Down Under the Big Top foregoes the lavishness and abundance and skips straight to the rat eating. <laughs> Thought I gave you the tail. Phil Joel plays a fictional version of himself who ran away from home and joined the circus doing odd jobs like costume maintenance and sanitation. Despite his labor, Phil doesn't even make enough money to regularly afford the postage needed to send letters asking his parents for help. Still, his parents just seem to want him to be safe. But at least we knew he was alive and, and fine. He was fine. And he wanted to know how we were. We were fine, too. We were fine. The rest of the newsboys also play themselves. Congratulations, you played yourself. The story revolves around the band just as much as it does Phil. The aforementioned song, Reality, is played to set the stage for Phil's story. This bit is interspersed with a live performance by the Newsboys featuring crowd-surfing people, a crowd-surfing marlin, a crowd-surfing gorilla, and even a crowd-surfing chicken. And we haven't even gotten to the circus part yet! In the following scene, we see former vocalist John James visit his dying uncle Luigi. I am allowed exactly one Super Mario joke, and I guarantee I will squander it. Next to him is a clergy named... clergy who provides translation. You were the last of the bloodline, but your heart was not in it. It would seem John is the only member of his family who didn't have an interest in the circus. Like Phil, he also ran away from home to pursue his dreams. The movie establishes that John is somewhat estranged from his extended family, but it's still unsettling to see John's reactions during this scene. Now the spaceman. <laughs> he's not really sad or shocked. He doesn't share any joy when his uncle laughs. He's just kind of uncomfy the whole time. And that's really weird, even when it's supposed to be played for a laugh. Uncle Luigi intends to disband his circus, but not before putting on one final show in an attempt to pay off his creditors and allow his wife to retire. His last request is for John to use his star power to pull the whole thing off in a single week. John volunteers the rest of the band to help. So this is an act of God. Your uncle dies, that's an act of God. You sign us up for the circus during our week off, that's an act of John. You tell the rest of the band. They're all pretty reluctant, seeing as how this isn't the style of performance they're used to, but when their bass player suddenly quits and they can't tour without one, they decide to see it through. The boys hold an informal chapel service with the circus troupe, which is one of my favorite scenes. There's an obvious clash between the two groups, and not just in terms of nationality. It's written to be funny, but it's strangely relatable. 
And before we begin our service with a prayer, I was wondering whether there might be any requests you might have. Free bird. <laughs> John asks everyone for prayer requests, which is something that Protestant Christians just kind of do without thinking about it. And the requests range from making the magic god make my lottery ticket win, to just kind of vague wishes for everything to go alright. Among the rest of the carnies are Mongo, the dull and strong type, Hack and Sack, the sleazy clowns, the latter being considerably sleazier than the former, and twin sisters Darlene and Carlene. These two adorably jump in on each other's sentences and are consistently in sync. If we all just you know, pull together, together, we just feel like everything's just gonna turn out for the best. Yeah, for the best. At first I figured this was just because they had practiced together for the movie, but in doing some of my preliminary research for the script, I found the actresses actually do this in real life all the time. Every once in a blue moon, we yeah. buy the exact same, same dress. dress. Yeah. Of course they sleep in twin beds. We go to sleep at the exact same time and wake, wake up, up at the exact, exact same time. time. Wow, that's so cool. It sounds like it's none of our fucking business. A running joke that I really love is how there's a gag earlier on where John misspeaks and pulls out a remote control to rewind time and correct himself. And the fact that he has this power just kind of becomes canon. Excuse me, but why did your friend say, thanks, darling? I, I didn't. You did. John, could you? My battery's a lie. Zack sends Phil to discreetly deliver a message in the middle of the night to a couple of shady thugs. Kid could get hurt. So Ralph and Rocco pull up, right? And Ralph pulls out a cigar to smoke, and then Rocco pulls out a gun, right? But it's not a gun. It's, it's a lighter. It's a lighter for the cigar, but it looks like a gun. Uh, we'll workshop it. Ralph represents a Little People's Performers Union, and it's always really bonkers to me when workers' unions are shown as antagonistic forces. Ralph threatens to shut down the circus because... Sack is a scab? I suppose the union were either striking or avoiding Circus Luigi, and Sack the Clown was hired on to fill the role of a little person, even though he's not one, just a guy who's a bit short. If your circus is hiring short guy scabs, then I'm gonna do everything I can do to shut you down. Jumping ahead a bit, there is a point during a circus performance where Sack jumps out and explicitly shouts, I'm little people! <laughs> so like, sure, but that's one hell of a stretch just for the filmmakers to work anti-union rhetoric into their niche market direct-to-video movie. I don't think I know the difference between little and short. Show him, Rocco. That didn't even hit. Because little people don't hurt anyone. This movie is a lot. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Hack has been tasked with training the new boys, the newsboys, the ways of the circus. These scenes are mostly good-natured and deal with technique. They learn juggling, slapstick, and the proper methods for taking a pie to the face. This is a common error that even a lot of pros make. They lick too soon. One Mississippi and lick. Hack has this strange duality where in one scene he scolds Jeff for losing sight of the real goal, that is, entertaining children. I know you're going back to dialysis tomorrow. Right now you just want to laugh at the clowns, but Jeff here needs to know if he's going to be tested on his pie licking tomorrow. But later reinforces the idea that the circus is all about mega cash. Mega cash. If you can't spell mega cash, you can't smell success. And he's not wrong, they did establish that the point of the circus is to pay off Luigi's creditors and fund his wife's retirement. But it is in conflict with the children's hospital analogy that Hack pulls out. Hack is also trying to go viral, you know, before viral was a thing, by filming the clown lessons in hope that something silly will happen that he can share on an AFV style show. This is fantastic! I guess I shouldn't have put it on pause, hey? <laughs> As the band plays the song Breathe, enter Mark Lowry, a celebrity among Christians and Christians exclusively. Mark Lowry co-wrote the song Mary Did You Know, has a prolific career as a comedic musician, and was a member of the Gaither Vocal Band. And if the name Gaither rings a bell, odds are good that either your childhood was sabotaged like mine was, or you know Mark Lowry from his most notorious work. This is gonna be my best newsletter ever! Say, Carp, what you doing? Just my newsletter. Why? I'm not sure growing up with Gaither's Pond is something I'm ready to admit just yet. Mark's role in the film only lasts for this one scene as he directs a TV spot for the circus. 
The band is still without a bass player, and Mark insists that they find one in order to reach the teenagers. Be because doesn't it make that sound that the kids love that's sort of low and rumbly? Look, having a bassist in the band is a good call, but everyone knows that trying to appeal to teenagers is the fastest way to not appeal to teenagers. Hi, I'm a normal person just like you. I like to listen to the rock music. Phil lends his bass playing skills to the band using a homemade washtub bass hastily fashioned from a bucket, microphone, a string, and a mop. Mop the bass. Okay, I said it. <laughs> the song Breathe continues, now featuring those low and rumbly notes the kids love. It's incorporated into a montage where the week passes and everyone trains their circus acts. Phil puts up a flyer, which gets covered, and then he gets sent to jail for removing the other poster. For starters, that accent he picked up from them. Oh, There's something funny to me about this line from Phil's parents. Phil supposedly picked up that accent from the newsboys, even though the newsboys are Australian, and Phil is from New Zealand, and his parents are American. And also, Phil had the accent before he met the newsboys in the movie, so like, that's a thing too. And if we get paid next week, we might be able to afford a stamp. The song rocks, but it's unsettling watching the cast mouth along with the line, breathe the breath of God, which has this weird implication that the newsboys not only tried to evangelize the carnies, but also teach them to perform their own music, even though it's not part of the circus act. Evangelizing to Phil makes sense in context because Phil confides in John about his spiritual crisis. John, I'm having a spiritual crisis of sorts. But evangelizing to the rest of the circus comes apropos of nothing. It's just the film making sure that every likable character is a believer by the end. When the montage is over, Hack goes through a list of the essentials of the circus and reviews the proposed acts. John takes on the role of ringmaster in his late uncle's place, Darlene and Carlene plan to perform an acrobatic routine with a dog, and Peter juggles chainsaws as Pietro, the juggler of death. No circus would be complete without Pietro. Hack is visibly underwhelmed by the state of things, with only a single day until showtime. It's strange because as the scene goes, the movie does the thing where they flip between a hypothetical version of what's going to happen and the present while they're still discussing how it could go. The stage lights flicker, Peter can't do his death-defying juggling act, NO GAS! And the twins replace their acrobatic puppy routine with a hamster. Except after the scene is over, we find out that all of those hypotheticals were the real thing. Like, all of those things happened during the actual show. The cinematic language doesn't really communicate that clearly at first, so it's a bit jarring. The scene lasts for about 10 minutes, but it feels weird to call it a single scene given all the swapping that happens between discussion and showtime. Regardless, it's a fun buildup that has a lot of great gags, like how everyone wipes their feet on the welcome mat as they step into the ring even though the floor is mulch. There are some fun background gags like this blueprint of a whoopee cushion on the wall, and plenty of good-natured Australian dialect humor. It rhymes with ointment. Excitement? Exactly. Fans of the Newsboys will also notice that all of the music that plays during the circus are organ covers of existing songs by the band. Everyone's a little disheartened because while some of Hack's eight essentials of the circus are present, they don't have anything in the way of a grand finale. That is, until Phil comes in with his own pitch, the Human Mirror Ball, an act where he dons a suit in the shape of a giant sphere of mirrors. Or spherers and gets hoisted into the air as lights reflect off of him. This is the literal only instance I've heard it called a mirror ball and not a disco ball, though I'm sure disco came with its own set of implications in a religious setting, given the association with recreational drug use and sexual liberation. Regrettably, none of that can be found here, just pretty lights. Phil's human mirror ball would be really cool if they could pull it off in real life, though hopefully using a harness and not a mouth guard attached to a rope. Hurts to think about. Anyway, the finale is a real spectacle, and we see the audience actually enthused by the show for the first time since it started. But Mongo is in charge of keeping Phil in the air, and he gets spooked by Rocco's gun that's not a gun, but is a lighter that looks like a gun. It's a lighter. La Mongo lets go of the rope, and the giant ball plummets onto the unsuspecting sack. Wow, that's, uh, really in my script. Steve Taylor, who you may remember directed the movie, makes a cameo where he talks meta about why the music video for Take Me To Your Leader was included. And he says, well, maybe it could be a dream sequence. Personally, I find that outside the realm of movie musicals, full-length songs in films are almost always too long to justify being included. It's fine if there's other dialogue or action happening over the song, 
but when it's just characters performing the music, or a whole music video in this case, it's too much. Dream sequence or not. The funny thing about this music video is that it was thrown into the film to make it longer, but because it's filler, it actually makes my script shorter. Phil wakes up after the accident and discovers that the final show was a bust. And so is Sack, from the look of it. A little detail I appreciate is how Ralph accuses Sack of mistreating the real little people in his business pursuits, and we see this paralleled by how Sack interacts with buzzing houseflies throughout the film. In one scene, he's chasing them with a swatter, in another, he's watching them fry in a bug zapper, and after he's been injured and the circus disbanded, he watches helplessly as a fly crawls across his face. What John's trying to say is, we lost our shirts. It would seem everyone's effort has gone to waste, but in a classic example of Deus Ex Machina, the tape of the accident goes old viral and sells for six figures, earning enough of that mega cash for Uncle Luigi's widow to retire and presumably to pay off his debts. The circus performers join the band for a celebratory concert and Phil joins the band for a he's in the band now ing. Film ends with an entirely out of left field scene of a Japanese grandmother putting her daughters to bed with a newsboys tape of the music video for Shine. It's wholly unnecessary, beyond lengthening the movie and creating hype for people who enjoy the song already. Also, Shine rips its primary melody from You Sexy Thing by Hot Chocolate, which is not exactly a deep cut. <laughs> The post credit scene includes a callback to the remote control gag, featuring a joke about evangelizing in other countries using rifles. That's not a joke. I, I mean, it, it is a joke, but I'm not joking about how that that's a real joke that- never mind. The post post credit scene is a promo for Cross Training, a study course based on a Newsboys album. The promo is less about what's in the study course, and more just the band reiterating, Bible good, while features of the course appear in random spots on the screen. Kinda slimy that the movie, which itself is a sort of promo for the Newsboys' body of work, still felt the need to include a more literal advertisement at the end. So that's Down Under the Big Top. Including the music videos and the credits, the whole thing just barely tips over the one hour mark. So it's a short movie, but it's not a little movie. Because little movies don't hurt anyone. The film seems to make lots of jokes at the expense of people's appearance. Gags centered around someone's look aren't inherently harmful, but these ones are almost exclusively the down-punching kind. You know, the kind where the punchline basically boils down to, isn't it silly that someone looks like that instead of normal? Phil gets misgendered multiple times because of his long hair. Welcome, miss. Come on in. Uh, uh sorry there, mate. One of the carnival guys is revealed to be bald. Phil is antagonized by a tall, overweight person putting up weight loss flyers. And the film's thugs are a couple of little people who pointedly don't rough anyone up. I'll give it some credit for handling Ralph and Rocco better than other comedies of the era, but it still leaves something to be desired. These kinds of follies will usually garner a sneer out of me and not much more. It's low-hanging fruit, and it should go without saying that belittling people for their harmless sense of style, or for traits they don't have control over, is shitty. Like Down With Love, there's no black cast in the story, though Tommy Sims does make a cameo as an aside. It may be worth mentioning here, but it's only scratching the surface of the big issues at play in Down Under the Big Top. As we've seen, the movie is very faith-centric. Not as overtly as other alternative Christian media of the era, but it's hard to miss. Much of it feels like it's phoned in, like how we don't see Phil struggle with himself or his faith until the second half when he tells John he's having a spiritual crisis out of nowhere. John! I'm having a spiritual crisis of sorts. We don't see that struggle fleshed out at all beyond a couple of shallow scenes where he talks about having done some thinking, as though coming to be indoctrinated into Christianity is a purely intellectual conclusion. Phil is reunited with his parents at the end, but we literally never see them speak to each other. It's the most central faith-based conflict in the movie, and yet it feels incredibly glossed over. It's clear that the movie isn't meant to be an evangelical tool unto itself. If it is, it undeniably fails. Watch there be one person in the comments who calls this movie formative in their faith journey. Rather, I think Down Under the Big Top is meant to be a comedy for Christians. And like anything that's for Christians, it does its best to reinforce those values in a way that's very casual. Phil's coming to faith is glossed over because it's something that the intended audience doesn't need to hear in its entirety. They just need to be reminded that getting people to come to faith is something that they should be automatically doing. Phil doesn't pose any tough questions for John, and the other characters who have presumably been evangelized too are never seen challenging it. 
in this world, the act of evangelizing others is normalized to the point where it's accepted uncritically. If you're walking a dog that's well-trained, you don't need to tug on their leash. They'll just follow along, obediently, even long after they've forgotten the bruises around their neck that made them obedient in the first place. Of the carnies, Mongo is the most uninterested in the whole god thing, and his character is shown as socially unaware, physically unappealing, and xenophobic even toward Australians. You think you'd ask God to knock some sense into that shiny foreign head of yours and get us a ringmaster who at least speaks American? Notice the low camera angles to highlight his size. Remember my remark about everyone mouthing, breathe the breath of God? During this bit, Mongo's the only one mouthing the words incorrectly. Everything that goes into writing, casting, and filming these characters is done on purpose. And while I don't think it's wrong to design your characters' traits around their ideology, you have to admit, making them overweight and clueless is an awfully scummy way to do it. This is a common tool of propaganda, framing the sort of person you dislike as viscerally abhorrent rather than intellectually so. What the producers have done here is say, look at the fat atheist man, see how ugly and stupid he is, not like these handsome exotic Christian men. Mongo's not exactly a lead character, but he doesn't need to be. His characterization just needs to be seen as normal. Speaking from my experience in the church, this is a very normal trope. Across all of Christian media, characters who are either atheistic or of conflicting religious affiliations are most often antagonists. They're supplemented with things like ugliness, deceitfulness, and a lack of conventional education. Only sometimes do they get a redemption arc, and when they do, it always ends with indoctrination. It's never enough to have the protagonist just convince someone that lying is bad, or encourage them to go back to school. If it doesn't involve that other person having a come-to-Jesus moment, there's just no lesson for them at all. Mongo is only a minor antagonistic force in this movie. He serves to discourage the newsboys and his fellow performers early on, and as I mentioned, this is not an evangelical movie as much as it is a popcorn movie for established Christians. Phil is also not an antagonist to the other characters, though the audience is made to see him as an obstacle against his own best interests. He runs away to join the circus, which the movie frames as a godless thing to do, and he only returns home once he's accepted a life of faith. It's interesting that the movie does this considering how they treat John's fictional backstory. When he visits his uncle, we learn that John also ran away from home. He was meant to be a part of the circus tradition, but chased his dream of being a performing musician instead. The movie never frames this instance of abandoning one's old home life as problematic. Since John is a believer, he's celebrated for leaving home to pursue his dream. Meanwhile, Phil, who isn't a believer at the start of the film, isn't celebrated. Movies like this necessitate that non-believers be relegated to an other status, lest their perspectives be seen as valid or fulfilling. Even having a non-religious character as neutral poses a threat. A note about the song Shine, the song the movie ends on, is that it's one of, if not the most popular song by the Newsboys, and a staple of modern Christian music in general. Shine is also a song that includes lyrics that poke fun at mental illness, as well as one with homophobic implications. It's clear the word they want to use here is gay, because it rhymes with ballet. But Peter hesitates saying happy, which only half rhymes, and is synonymous with gay's original meaning. In the music video, the bouncer is shown in an ill-fitting ballet dress, and the others wince in disgust. The schizophrenic joke is particularly insidious because it compares the embrace of the Christian faith to a mentally ill person being magically cured in the same way that it inspires um, a dictator to retire and an Eskimo to renounce fur. I could have a field day dissecting how the rise of fascism in the modern age is closely linked to Christian ideology, the problematic use of Eskimo as a catch-all term for northern natives, or the ethics of animal hunting by those groups. But these are topics that much more well-read and well-spoken people than me have covered. Suffice to say, the Newsboys chose their comparisons very poorly. And not just because they were insensitive, but very telling when it comes to how closed off Christians tend to be from the society around them. Also, the geisha in the music video eats a hamster. Cool. Down Under the Big Top has a lot to unpack, but even so, it still has a charm about it. It's not something I can wholeheartedly recommend to just anyone. I think Christians will more or less find it innocuous, but for anyone else, you've been given more than adequate warning at this point. All of that said, it's still an enjoyable movie for me. 
It's unironically clever and funny in places, and even when it's not, it manages to at least be ironically entertaining. It's something that I still quote from time to time, and I've even referenced it in my YTPs before. Wanna hear a secret? Hearie. My real name is Secret. Secret? Ah, oh, come on, you can tell me. No, that's not a secret, it's secret. Like I mentioned, it's on YouTube as of this recording, and it's only an hour long. It's important to remember that we're not immune to propaganda. Even the things that we find endearing and nostalgic need to be examined for what they are, and not just how they make us feel. If all we can bring ourselves to care about is whether or not something makes us laugh, then what are we, if not just a bunch of clowns?